Order. It is time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. I call Mrs Sandra Overend. Mrs Overend. Thank you. Question number one, please. I call the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In overall terms, the total level of current expenditure funding awarded to my department in 2015-16 is some £123 million greater than that available in 2014-15. This increase takes account of the uplift that was outlined in the Executive's Budget for 15-16 and the additional non-recurrent in-year allocations made to my department through the monitoring round process. The Executive's Budget for 2015-16 provided an additional £200 million for frontline health services, but my department was also required to make some £50 million in savings in other areas of its budget, including the fire service and my other arms length bodies. In addition, the level of assistance available to my department in 2015-16, through the monitoring round process, is approximately £30 million less than that received in 2014-15. I welcome the Executive's past support in providing additional funding to my department and will look to its continued support in the future so that my department is best placed to meet the health and social care needs of the people of Northern Ireland. Call Mrs Overend for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Uh, for the information. I obviously welcome the recent allocation of £40 million, but um, the Minister has rightly indicated that there was far more money awarded last year, yet the situation then continued to worsen. Uh, can he actually explain what, aside from temporary uh, reprieves, what he has done to actually get to grips with what is clearly escalating costs? Well, I, think, I think everybody understands and appreciates, and I'm sure the member does too, um, the increasing pressure that there is on, on, on health um, in our society and indeed across most societies um, with huge increases in, in demand um, for, for most services. Um, some of that demand is of course driven by positive things like technological advances and advances in drugs and, and in medicine uh, and that puts increasing pressure on a system which is facing pressure all the time um, and that's why I have been focusing on the need to reform our system because it is very, very clear to me that continuing on with the system operating as it currently exists um, is not going to suffice into the future, and we can start to see those pressures starting to build up. We understand the, the problems that are being caused by having a, a growing and an aging population. Great that it is that we're all living longer, but the fact that many of us are living longer with one or more chronic condition, um, conditions, the fact that we have, uh, and the Chair was talking about it in a, in a different context earlier, about unhealthy lifestyles and the the ticking time bomb that that presents for society necessitates reform of our system. We cannot continue to um, spend huge, and I, I, I believe that in the short term we need to spend more in health in part to address those, those immediate needs that are there, but also to just start to reform and transform our system. Uh, we have to be realistic that that increase, particularly at times of, of pressure on our budget, is not sustainable in the very, very long term. So we need to make those reforms and transformations to get our health service onto a sustainable foot footing and also make those reforms uh, around taking out layers of bureaucracy within our system and also ensuring that um, we have a configuration of services, both in health and in social care, which meets the needs of our population, um, but it puts at the forefront um, the need to ensure the highest standard of care uh, and safety for our patients. So it will be that focus, that relentless focus on reform um, that I will continue to pursue and I would hope that whoever is in my post after the election will continue to do so. Call Mr Ian McCree for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. What scope does the Minister see for efficiency savings within this department and what level of savings has he been able to achieve up to this point? Well, yeah. um, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I, I very much welcome the additional resources that uh, were granted to my department by me, actually, when I was in the Department of Finance. Um, and whilst many at the time argued that that wasn't uh, enough, including the health minister of the time, and I understood and appreciated that it wasn't enough to meet all of the demand that the department and the health service faces, um, it was in the context of a very difficult budget, and which will continue to be a very difficult budget, uh, a significant boost and a vote of confidence in, 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 and a reflection of the the support that there is across the political spectrum and, and wider society for, for health. Um, but that uplift, that 123 million of resources, additional resources, wouldn't have been enough in itself to meet the, uh, to, to tackle the rising demand as best as we possibly could. And that's why the department continued with its pursuit of efficiency savings 
uh, in this financial year, and that's been something that we've been doing um, vigorously over this budget period, um, or over the, this assembly term, rather. So between 11, 2011 and 2016, after the assembly election, uh, we have released 800, or we were are, are set to release by the end of this financial year, 825 million pounds, nearly a billion pounds in, in, in efficiency savings from the system. And that compares very favourably to what was achieved in 2007 to 2011, which a member in the House will recall was a, a very different time in terms of our public finances, when only 426 million was released between in efficiency savings between 2007 and 2011. So since the Assembly election, since the new Assembly term in 2011, nearly double has been released in efficiency savings um, by my party and members' party and our colleagues who have been in office. And that money has been able to go into the front line to help relieve some of those pressures that our hospitals and our social care sector are facing. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. At his annual conference, the Minister pledged an extra billion pounds in spending in health uh, over the next five years. Could the Minister detail where this money will come from, and has he had discussions around that with his executive colleagues? I, what, I, what I pledged, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to pledge, was that, I, that my party would seek to increase expenditure on health and social care by a billion pounds over the next assembly term. Uh, and it is my view that that is a financial boost which is required to not only meet the pressures that we face, the well publicised pressures that the department and the system faces in the short term, but also to, in the longer term, get our health service, our social care service onto a sustainable footing by investing considerable amounts in reform and in transformation and in innovation within our system. So that's something that, that I am pledged to do. That is something that I have discussed. Uh, with the party and with the, particularly with the finance minister who supports it, um, understanding the challenge that it presents. And it was as much, Mr Deputy Speaker, a challenge to other parties, including the members' party, to support that boost in expenditure, that needed boost in, um, in expenditure for health and social care over the next five years to transform and also to relieve the pressures that the system faces. And it will be up to others to support that. And, and obviously, it's a matter for the finance minister in terms of the constraints that she faces in crafting a budget for next year. Uh, I will certainly do my best. Uh, I will fight hard for a substantial uplift, the much needed substantial uplift in expenditure on health and social care, because I do believe that it is needed. Uh, um, but I understand and fully appreciate the constraints that the finance minister faces. Some of those constraints will, of course, be the views of other parties and whether or not they support it or not. And I have heard different comments and different responses from various parties, including some in the chamber who have outright opposed it. I haven't heard the member saying whether he supports a billion pounds uplift in, in health or not. Um, if he doesn't, um, I would ask him to explain why he doesn't and to set out why he doesn't believe that health, given all of the complaining that he and his party does about health, why it doesn't need that uh, substantial increase in, in funding. May I point out to members that question number three has been withdrawn. I call Mr William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Matter Hospital has a proud and enduring heritage of providing high-quality services to the people of North Belfast and beyond, and I pay tribute to the hospital staff for their dedication and service to the local community. I fully understand that any change to hospital services causes concern to the local community and their representatives. I reassure members that the action taken by the Belfast Trust in respect of emergency department services at the matter was a temporary change taken as a precautionary measure in response to concerns expressed by senior medical staff about staffing levels in the hospital's emergency department. The Belfast Trust therefore took the decision on 13 November to temporarily suspend ambulance arrivals from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m and to redirect children arriving at the emergency department to the nearby Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children, which has a dedicated paediatric emergency department. The emergency department has remained open on a 24-7 basis throughout, and the ambulance divert was lifted on Thursday, the 26th of November. However, the temporary redirection of paediatric patients under 14 years of age to the Children's Hospital is continuing, and the Belfast Trust is monitoring the temporary arrangement. Call Mr. Humphrey for supplementary. Thank you very much, and I thank the minister for his answer. Can I thank the minister for the meeting he facilitated last week with party colleagues and myself, and with trustees from the Matter Hospital itself? Can I ask the minister, as a supplementary, how many, uh, what are the numbers attending 
the Accident Emergency Unit in the matter over the last number of years? Uh, can I thank the, the member for, for his comments. And, um, I was glad that um, actually the member, of, of member for Parliament, uh, Mr Nigel Dodds, was able to he was very quickly after the um, issue arose in the Matter Hospital, he contacted my office to facilitate a, a meeting and a discussion, which I'm very glad that the member and, um, and other colleagues from the North Belfast constituency were also able to attend, as well as people from, from the Matter Hospital. Um, and I think it is clear, and I, I was glad we were able to do that because it, it allowed me to, to offer, I hope, some reassurance around the, the future of the Matter Hospital, which Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the member and colleagues will communicate to the local community in North Belfast. Um, but around, and I, I think that the question that he asked around um, attendances at the emergency department in the matter highlights how important it is within the overall Belfast Trust picture, in particular around, around emergency services. For, in 2010-2011, there were 4, 41,405 attendances in that year. Um, in the last full year, 14-15, it had risen to 45,623. And in each of those years in between, it had risen each and every year. So it has been growing and growing and growing over that, over that period. Um, so it is, it is clearly a key part with, with obviously the, the, the issues around the temporary nature of the divert and the, um, the issues around paediatrics. Notwithstanding, it still has an important role to play within the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust in providing emergency department services. Uh, and I mean, it was my understanding, having spoken to uh, officials, that even with the investment in the Royal Victoria Hospital and the uh, new emergency department there, that logistically that hospital couldn't cope with all of those, that influx of numbers coming into the Royal Victoria Hospital. So, you know, notwithstanding those issues that there are, and we've always got to put patient safety to the fore. Um, the matter has an important role in its emergency department to play within the Belfast Trust area. Call Mr. Sean Rogers for supplementary. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Earlier in your answer, Minister, you talked about patients being redirected from the matter to the, to the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. However, we heard last week that the latter is experiencing pressures which has resulted in cancelled operations. What, what assurances can you give to, to ensure that those operations that have been cancelled that they'll receive their treatment in a timely manner? I'm, I'm aware of the issue that the, the member raises in terms of um, operations for, for sick children in the uh, Belfast, um, Royal Belfast uh, Hospital for Sick Children. In my understanding, this has been due to a, a spike in seasonal bron bronchiolitis. I'm learning a new um, language in this job. Uh, and all children's wards in Northern Ireland have experienced an increased number in admissions for that condition. Um, I understand, too, that this is not something that's just particular to Northern Ireland either. This is a, a, a national uh, increase in the number of people presenting or young children presenting with bronchiolitis. Um, and obviously, in, in, in those situations where beds are, are full or close to being full within, um, within our hospitals, whether it's for paediatrics or for any other uh, area of specialism, it is important that we ensure that um, there's a safety for, for patients and the quality of care remains high. And in those, those circumstances, those exceptional circumstances, I think it is only right that the clinicians and the, the trust take the judgment to cancel non-emergency surgery in those circumstances. It's not something that clearly we want to see, and it's not something we want to see happening uh, frequently, but I think in the circumstances, I think we understand the pressure that was put on the hospital. I think it's only right that they did what they did, and clearly we want to see those uh, surgeries slotted back in as quickly as possible so that people aren't inconvenienced any further. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister accept that the four-hour waiting target has been set only after sound medical advice, and that for some people, the longer they're forced to wait, the more harm they actually come to? And is the Minister satisfied that the patient's safety is not being compromised as a result of the pressures, not only in the matter, but all of our hospitals? Well, yeah, I, I, on the first point, you know, yeah, I, I accept that the target has been set on the basis of, of using clinical advice, and, and equally, I think we should be we should be open not just with that target, but with any targets that existed. If the evidence coming from our clinicians are that the targets aren't serving a useful purpose, um, that we should be open to changing changing those targets. And certainly, if uh, and I know that there have been there's a number of the targets that we we, we work towards and measurements that we take that. Uh, some clinicians and conversations certainly I've had with various royal, royal colleges have questioned the efficacy of, of some of the targets that we have. So I think I, I'm very open to, on, on the best advice that is there, to looking at targets from time to time and the figures that we have there. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we all understand the pressures that are 
uh, particularly our emergency mm -hmm. departments are under. Um, we've talked about it in respect of a, a range of different hospitals over the last number of question times that I've been in the House. Um, we know the issues that there are with recruitment of particularly consultants for emergency departments. Uh, and clearly we want to see, particularly as we, as we enter into what is the, the, the period of the year with the winter and where pressures become even more acute in emergency departments. We understand that the difficulties that, that, that can arise at this particular time of the year. That's why I met with um, chief executives from all of our, our trusts uh, on, um, uh, yesterday afternoon uh, to discuss their preparedness for the winter, um, which we're already, I suppose, in the middle of or at the start of. Um, and I had discussions, detailed discussions with them about what they were doing in their areas to address any pressures that are arising and it may arise. Um, we talked about the additional four million pounds that the November monitoring round has allowed to be released to deal with emergency department pressures or pressures around the winter. Uh, and, and I also uh, informed them that we would be giving them greater flexibility to spend that money. I don't want, in the spirit of the reforms that I announced some weeks ago, I don't want to see departments having to come up or trust coming up to the department to seek permission to do things that will, will, will benefit patient safety and quality of care in the short term. Call Mr Gordon Dunn for a question. Question for Mr Deputy Speaker, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the 4th of November, I outlined wide-ranging, ambitious and radical plans for transforming our health and social care system. The proposed changes seek to reduce bureaucracy, as well as the Department taking firmer strategic control of our health and social care system. I want to make our trusts responsible for the planning of care in their areas and to give them the operational independence to deliver it. I have therefore proposed that we close down the Health and Social Care Board. Departmental officials are currently drafting a consultation document with six views on these changes. I aim to bring forward that consultation as soon as I can to gather views. I have been encouraged, Mr. Principal, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, by the positive response to my proposals from other politicians, from health and care professionals, and from members of the public. To Don for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. I think we all welcome the, the decision of the Minister to, to progress towards dissolving the Health and Social Care Board and the projected savings that will flow. And can the Minister see potential for change before the legislation is actually put in place? Mr Deputy Speaker, yeah, I, I think the, the Member uh, has welcomed the, the changes that I propose, and I think there is he, will have, uh, he and I have spoken about this in the past, and I think we agree that there, there has been a clear need for reform within our health and social care system in terms of administration and, and bureaucracy and taking out bureaucracy that isn't required. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that that's why there has been the broad, broad support that I spoke about from, from other political parties, from, uh, importantly from clinicians. Uh, and from uh, others within the, the public. Um, and I certainly, in, in coming to the decision that I did and, and making the announcement that I did in the 4th of November, I obviously listened to others and what others were saying, and I think that that's why um, there has been the, the consensus that there has been. Um, I think there has been a conflation of two issues that were contained within the speech that I made on the 4th of November, one being around uh, the panel that will look at the best configuration of our, of our services uh, and how long that might take to implement, and this issue of dismantling the Health and Social Care Board and taking out that bureaucracy and barrier to innovation. Uh, and I made some comments at the committee around taking about probably 18 months to, to do that uh, in terms of the board. Um, that, is, that is a reflection of what I believe to be the realistic timetable that it will take to get the legislation in place. place. Um, bearing in mind that there is an election coming up and um, that will, will stunt things for a while. But I, officials have been working um, assiduously on producing a consultation document. I hope to be able to be in a position to approve that shortly and launch that very quickly thereafter to start that process, an important process of consultation, which will uh, inform the drafting of legislation, which will be in place for, I hope, for early introduction into this place in the, in the new mandate. But there is work that can be done in the intervening period. We are doing some scoping work to see if there are changes that can be made that don't require legislation that give effect to the changes that I have proposed. I have met with the Chair and I have met with the Chief Executive of the Health and Social Care Board, and I am glad that they are uh, working together with me and my department to make that a reality. Mr. Rosie McCarley for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answers. And can I ask the Minister uh, if he can outline how roles within the Health and Social Care Board will be divided up? Yeah, well, I mean, in the, in the short term, there is there's clearly the, the work that I mean, I've, I've been I've been at pains to stress 
throughout this, um, since making a speech on the 4th of November, that this is uh, not about our staff, it's about the system in which they, they work in. So there, is, there are a lot of good staff right across our system, including within our board, who are doing very, very important, very critical work to make our health and social care system work. Uh, and, and clearly, we are not going to do away with those functions and those roles that those staff perform. Um, and I envisage staff going in various different directions. Some will come into the department, some will go to the trust, particularly those who are involved in the work of, of planning for need in, in particular areas, uh, and some may move towards a, uh, a public health agency, which I've said I want to see working much closer alongside the department and renewing its focus on, on the important work that it does. Um, so we will work through, and part of the scoping exercise that we are doing, will identify the best place to put staff to do various things. And, and, uh, and, and clearly there are some obvious ones, like planning for need, which we can see moving down to trust, but there are others which I think would be best placed back up into, into the department. But the, the important point to, to stress is that there are, this is about getting a, changing the system, reforming and transforming the system in which our excellent staff work in so that we can get the best out of their talents. I don't believe that the system that we currently have, with its additional layer of bureaucracy, which is causing so much um, difficulties in terms of getting innovation onto the ground, um, that that is taken away and that we, get the we, we, we give our staff, who work incredibly hard, the best system possible in which they can operate in, and we will all be the better for that because that will produce better results and better outcomes for all of us. Call Mr. Kieran McCarthy for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will know that there is, I understand, up to 600 people employed on the board at present or thereabouts. Um, and following on from the earlier question, the, these, are, these are people that have been there for a number of years doing a good job. Uh, can the Minister assure this House that there will be no redundancies? And also, could he um, advise the House as to what sort of savings is expected to come about as a result of uh, the abolition of this board? I, I, don't, um, I, don't, um, I don't envisage, to take the first point, I don't envisage any compulsory redundancies. That isn't to say, though, that there won't be um, the need to get rid of some posts, but I don't envisage that being as a result of a uh, compulsory redundancy process. Um, and, and it is worth emphasising the point again, uh, given that he has raised it, that you know, this is about getting a system, a, an appropriate system in place for our staff to work in so that we can get the best from them. I don't believe that the system that is currently in place is getting the best out of our staff um, and the talent and skills and abilities that are there are not being optimised in a system where you have far, far too many layers in a very small region like ours. Um, in, in, in respect of the... Um, um, the issues around, I'm trying to, I think I've, what was the second, the second one? Savings. Um, this is not being done, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with savings in mind. That is not one of the, the criteria that I have set as a, that I want to see as a result of this reform. This is about reforming and transforming the system, giving our staff that good system to operate, the best system possible for which they can do their work in. Um, I, I do envisage that some savings will be, will be made. The budget for the board is currently around 30, uh, million pounds so you know even uh, sort of 10 uh, percent savings would be three million pounds and whether it's three million or two million or one million pounds worth of savings i can ensure the member and the house deputy speaker that those savings will re be redeployed back into the front line to ensure better care for our citizens call mr roy begs for supplement deputy speaker the public could not understand why so many uh, high powered individuals and high paid individuals were employed both within the department and within the Health and Social Care uh, Board. So I think we'd just like to welcome this, this change, that, that, uh, review that's happening. But has the Minister not got a target in terms of savings that will come out of it, as well as other organisational advantages that will come from it? And does it accept that there are far too many people who, that it has grew and grew and grew far too large during the past number of years? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think I, I think it's wrong to start off with health and social care reforms of this nature on the basis of this is about saving money. If we can save money, and I expect that we will save money, then I think that is an advantage, that is something additional um, that we should welcome. Um, but the, the whole purpose here, to reiterate the points that I've made to the previous two, two members, is to create a system which gets the best out of the staff who operate within health and social care across Northern Ireland. I don't think that they have been given 
through the reforms that were taken forward by the, the, the member's colleague, Mr. McGimsey, when he was minister. I don't think they have been given a system which maximises their, their talents and their skills and their abilities. And, and I do accept him, uh, uh, the point that he makes about the size of the board growing. Um, it, is, it is increased by, um, in the last, uh, since, its, since its birth, since its inception in 2010, by around 160 members of staff. Um, interesting, Mr. Mr. McGimsey, when he was given an interview recently, to the Belfast Telegraph um, said that he wanted this organisation, the board, to be a lean organisation. And he quote said, I said, and this is Mr. McGimsey, there should be a maximum of 250 staff, but after a lot of crying and wailing the, that they couldn't do it with that number of people, I allowed it to go to 350. Well, he didn't actually allow it to go to 350 in 2010, which was during Mr. McGimsey's tenure. It started off at 436 members of staff, considerably north of 350 and a lot higher than the 250 that he envisaged. Uh, and I, I presume the people that he was talking about crying and wailing were the civil servants who he told me at the committee couldn't run uh, a health service, but it's pretty clear that they could wrap him around their little finger and get him to do whatever they wanted because he nearly doubled what he wanted to start off on the board. Interesting though to point out at the same over the same period, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the number of staff within the department has decreased from 670 to 446, so down 224, more, considerably more than the number of staff in, that has increased in the board. I call Ms. Claire Hanna for a question. Question five. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've recently made a statement indicating that I have no desire to impose a contract on junior doctors in training, but that my preferred way forward is through negotiation. I welcome the outcome from the ACAS discussions between the Department of Health and the BMA and that all parties are willing to explore how best to deliver together on a new doctor, junior doctor's contract. I see this as a great opportunity and I'm optimistic that these discussions will lead to an agreed way forward. I therefore think that it would be pertinent to await the outcome of these exploratory talks before making a considered decision for Northern Ireland. Ms. Hannah for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. I think you will understand the frustrations of, of ordinary junior doctors, particularly given the swifter resolution of this in uh, Scotland and Wales. Um, you'll be aware that, as well as their safety concerns, junior doctors are worried about uh, the impact this issue will have on, on recruitment. In light of George Osborne's uh, autumn statement and the announcement on nursing, bursaries and the potential loss of that uh, subvention for student nurses. Can you outline what plans your department have to address that issue and prevent it exasper exacerbating an already acute nursing shortage? Um, two, two issues which I'll, I'll try to deal with in the time available to me. Um, the, on the issue of, of junior doctor's contract, I welcome, as I said, the fact that um, both sides, Department of Health, uh, NHS employers and the junior doctor side are now engaged in discussions with short limited time period that that is that that's what I wanted to see from the start I think that is the most likely way to reach the conclusion that I want to see which is an agreed contract uh, for the whole of the United Kingdom she used the term a sort of swifter resolution uh, in Scotland and Wales I don't accept that terminology that it was a swifter resolution Scotland and Wales took a particular uh, decision not to impose a contract. I didn't take that decision because I wanted to encourage uh, both sides to go back into negotiations. Uh, it may form a resolution from some people's perspective, but I don't consider it to be a resolution, a satisfactory resolution, rather, I should say, of a situation which would ensure that an, a, a contract which has been agreed by all sides previously as being not fit for purpose remains in place. Uh, in respect of, uh, and that's why I want to see a negotiated uh, settlement around this issue, and I encourage. Uh, all sides to, to do so. Uh, and, and in relation to the nursery, nursing bursaries, I am aware of the decision or the announcement that was made in the uh, Chancellor's autumn statement. And the member will be aware that that is, doesn't impact on Northern Ireland because of, of devolution. Uh, and uh, when I entered the department back in May, there had been some work done by officials looking at the issue of nursing bursaries and also at nursing fees. Uh, which are both, I think, in most circumstances, paid for by, by the department. That's not a, a route that I wanted to go down, and I, I stopped that from, from heading on, heading down that direction. Um, and hopefully that gives some, some assurance to, to nurses. Um, but I do think there are issues in terms of particularly around retention of nurses after they qualify, and that's something that I'm keen to look at, uh, changes that perhaps we can make that I'm sure everybody would agree with that can, if we are investing in fees and if we're investing in bursaries and we're investing in nurses and nursing students, then I think we want to see that benefit of that investment actually in the health service here in Northern Ireland. That's something that I am keen to look at. 
I'm afraid that ends uh, the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, yesterday I attended the funeral in Belfast of Mr. Brian Withers, who died as a result of esophageal cancer. And while it was a sad event, it was also a celebration of his life, and in particular his tenacity in fighting for drugs to help extend his life. And he gained, he gained six, six years. Uh, what assurances can the Minister now give to people who are similarly stricken with cancer and other illnesses that they will uh, uh, not have to have a, a lonely and stressful journey in attempting to access drugs and that they will be available on an equitable basis? Call the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for, for raising the issue. And didn't, uh, obviously, didn't know Mr. Withers, who he mentioned, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure the member will pass on sympathies and condolences to his family. Um, the member may be aware that today I've um, announced the conclusions and my, um, my views and recommendations in respect of the consultation on the individual funding request. Uh, and I've agreed to proceed with three of the recommendations contained within that. I've agreed to remove. 95% um, exceptionality, um, which will, um, I think everybody agreed in the consultation was far too restrictive. Uh, I've also agreed to establish a regional scrutiny committee, which will have a, a, a much fairer, more consistent uh, and more clinically led approach to the issue of access to specialist drugs. Uh, and I'm um, going to start a piece of work in terms of revising guidance around individual funding requests. Uh, and whilst that um, doesn't help in the case that the, the member raises, or indeed some other cases. I, I hope that the member and indeed the whole House and those outside will recognise that this is positive progress in terms of improving access to specialist drugs within Northern Ireland. I, I haven't agreed to move forward on the creation of a specialist drugs fund or the introduction of prescription charges because of a lack of uh, political agreement around that issue, but the lifting of the 95 per cent exceptionality and the creation of a regional scrutiny committee will, I believe, substantially increase uh, access to specialist drugs for cancer patients and indeed others. Mr McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. People are dying, clearly, Mr Deputy Speaker, while they wait. And can the Minister assure the House that given the many millions of pounds that have become available under the PPRS scheme, uh, that appropriate monies will accompany uh, any new system? Well, you know, I think the member and I have had the discussion around the PPRS scheme before, and, uh, and what I do acknowledge the money that we, we get back in as a result of that. Much of that, on an annual basis, is used to uh, cover the cost of increasing, increasing cost of drugs elsewhere within the system. Um, so we are not sort of quids in or, or, or sitting with a lot of additional cash as a result of that. It is merely covering some of the, the costs that are there. And I'm, I know the member is mouthing the figure around 40 million quid that it is, 40 million pounds that it is. Shouldn't use an unparliamentary language of quid, um, but it is. It is. Um, um, not additional and over and above the cost, the increasing cost of, of drugs right across the system. And I do hope that you know, the member recognises, and I'm sure most people will recognise, the, the fact that what I have announced today will increase substantially access to specialist drugs for people who will have clinically led decisions. So rather than having, and one of the reasons I didn't go down the route of having a specialist fund in place was that I didn't want to put a particular figure on it. I wanted to have a clinically led decisions through the regional scrutiny committees as to what appropriate need was. Uh, and I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to reach agreement on the reintroduction of, of modest prescription charges. Um, and therefore, this um, additional cost will have to come from elsewhere within the health and social care budget. And that will, of course, put some, some pressure on a budget that is already uh, considerably challenged, Deputy Speaker. But I do think it is, for the reasons that the members outline and indeed those that I appreciate, and I'm sure others do too, the right thing to do. Well, Mr. Robin Swan for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure the Minister knows where I'm going with this one. As chair of the All Party Group of congenital, on congenital heart disease and the father of a, a child with congenital heart disease, can I just congratulate and thank the Minister for introducing the pulse oximetry trial in the Izzy Hill Hospital in conjunction with the Southern Health Trust? And could he update the House as to the findings and the outworkings of that trial? Mr. I've only become aware of the, the, the trial in, in recent times, um, Deputy Speaker, and you know I think you know we I think we all realise and acknowledge and recognise that, that it is innovation 
that um, will solve many of the problems that we've been talking around about our health and social care system. It, it, it comes sometimes at a considerable cost. That's why we're not always able to bring innovations and changes through the system as quickly as we would like. Sometimes bureaucracy gets in the way of that too. Uh, and I'm aware of the, the trial that the member is talking about. I, I have to say that I'm, I'm not fully appraised of it and therefore I don't want to say too much about it at this stage, but it's certainly something that, in fact, I was dis discussing with colleagues in recent days, and I, I'm, I'm keen to look into a bit more, and I, I'll certainly do that and update the member with uh, our views on how that is going and, and what impact that might have. And, and I know the member obviously has a particular interest in this issue, and he's every, he is absolutely right to continue to push for improvements in the service that uh, young children who have heart problems and heart defects that they have and to ensure that the service improves on an ongoing basis. That's something that I'm committed mm -hmm. to. I met recently with a children's heartbeat uh, charity and we discussed some of the issues that, that the uh, children and service users are facing. And I'm certainly committed to trying to do my best to, to take the service forward to ensure that the excellent service that is in Belfast continues and we, we, we put the All Island Network in place as quickly as possible. Call Mr Spong for supplement. I thank the Minister for that answer. Minister, in a written answer to me and your predecessors actually said they were going to wait on the results of the UK trial, which isn't due out until next September. So can I ask what changed the Minister's mindset? And also the big concern was that the number of false positives that come from that. Has he put in support mechanisms for both the parents, the children and the clinicians, not just in Daisy Hill, but also in Clark Clinic, to support those number of false positives that may come forward? I, I'm aware that the, the National Screening Committee, from which um, our administration and the others across the UK take guidance from on issues like this, um, have been running a pilot of their own, and that is due to report next year. Uh, and I certainly um, look at that evidence as well. I, the reason um, I said I would come back to the member is that I'm aware of what's happening in Daisy Hill through the Southern Trust. And obviously that is, that is a different trial to the one that the National Screening Committee are doing. I don't, think it's, it's, um, I don't think we should dismiss it because it isn't, but I'm certainly keen to look at it and examine it a lot closer to see what, uh, how it relates to what the National Screening Committee is doing to ensure that um, we, we learn all possible lessons from it, including those issues that the member has talked about so that we can um, iron out any problems, any wrinkles that there might be. Well, Mr Phil Flanagan for a topical question. The Minister will be aware of the proposals from the, the Western Health and Social Care Trust to, to close popular and effective day centres in Rusley, Gorchin and Dromore, um, and to downgrade centres in Belcoo, Garrison and Timor. Um, and a recent consultation proved to be a farce, with uh, well over a thousand people opposing these changes, but the Trust seem intent on moving ahead as planned. Anyway, can I ask the Minister if he is aware of the, the widespread um, public anger um, at this proposal? and at the failure of the, the Western Trust to listen to the views of local people and indeed local representatives on this issue? I, I, I'm, aware, I'm aware of the issues that the, the member raises, not least because party colleagues have raised them with me as much as anything. Um, and you know, I think the, the member will understand the, the pressures that the, the Western Trust are facing in terms of their budget, um, but also in terms of trying to redesign services that people are facing. And I think sometimes some of the changes can be seen through um, entirely through the prism of, of making budgetary savings in difficult circumstances, but also it will all, you know, very often what gets forgotten about is the fact that some services will change to provide better outcomes for people. Um, and in that sense, I think we all need to sometimes look at these with an open mind. Um, that doesn't mean that we should be supporting them willy-nilly or just because they, the trusts are coming forward with them. But certainly I'm aware of the concerns that there are there. Uh, decisions obviously of this nature will, will be, have to be made by the, the trust and, and then approved by the board before they would come before me. And they, at this stage, they haven't arrived at my desk. Mr Flanagan for supplementary. I'll ask and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, the, the Minister is right, these are being presented as budgetary savings, but won't you actually factor in the knock on increases in transportation costs um, across from and indeed parts of, of Tyrone? Um, it doesn't actually make financial sense. So, can I ask the Minister whether he'd be willing to accept a delegation um, from the local community to discuss these proposed changes um, once the, the information arrives in his desk so we can discuss this with all of the information at hand? Yeah, I, I'm certainly, you know, I, I, I will consider any and all of these sorts of decisions where there are changes to services, because I, I fully understand, as a member has articulated, the concerns that they can raise within local communities, particularly whenever it maybe isn't articulated as, as clearly as we would like what the benefit of a change might be. Uh, and that's why I think it's incredibly important to trust whenever they're making changes to services, are presenting 
to local representatives or presenting to the local community the benefit that a change will make. Uh, and, and clearly in circumstances where that is not obvious that you will meet the sort of opposition that the member is, is talking about. And, and I will approach any and all of these sorts of decisions that do arrive in my desk by considering carefully the, all of the evidence that is presented to me and, and will seek out other evidence as appropriate. Uh, and if that requires uh, meeting with people from the area to discuss their concerns, I, I'm, I'd be content to do that. Well, Mr J. Kelly for a topical question. Margaret, uh, could the Minister confirm that the uh, recent closures of residential homes run by the Four Seasons Group uh, was to do with uh, um, accrued debt for the business in England and not uh, to do with uh, financial uh, viability uh, here? Uh, well, I, I, I think the member's analysis is, is close to being spot on in respect of this issue. I think there have been, there have been some um, who have, no doubt for political reasons, sought to blame the Department of Health and not giving sufficient amounts of money to the Four Seasons business uh, to keep them going uh, through the tariff or whatever um, as being the reason um, for the failure or indeed issues around recruitment of nurses. But I think that the, the fact that here we have a, you have a business which is a substantial business and still providing a lot of care in Northern Ireland, much needed care within Northern Ireland, who have extensive debts, well publicised debts, uh, I think over uh, paying over 10% of their debt in terms of interest repayments, that, that has put a considerable pressure on the business. I think the, the announcement on Friday passed that two of the homes are actually going to be sold to other operators, operating private sector operators operating within the Northern Ireland market, does somewhat um, undermine the argument that some have put forward that this was entirely about a failure on my behalf or the department's behalf to give enough money to these operators. I am not for one second suggesting that there aren't challenges facing that sector around the likes of the uh, living wage, national living wage or indeed recruitment of appropriate staff, but the fact that other operators have been prepared so quickly to step in to take over these businesses, appreciate those are still going through their various processes, but the fact that there are others who are prepared to do that suggests that there is for them a profit to be made, contrary to what has been argued by some others. Mr. Kelly, for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer up to the end and following on from some of the information which he did give us. Is, is, does he then have a view, or is there any um, notion that there might be other uh, outside of the Four Seasons Group that there might be others at risk, or is there any checks that can be done in terms of that? Because there's a nervousness, as you will be aware, about at the moment. I, I don't have any. I mean, I, I appreciate the concerns that will still remain with uh, the operator that has been mentioned. I have no intelligence to suggest that there are others who are in similar positions. That isn't, of course, to say that there aren't pressures being faced by, by other operators, and, and I understand that. And certainly, listening to representatives of the independent sector, they are articulating the pressures that they are facing and expressing some concerns about future viability. Uh, and because of that, and because of the uncertainty. I, mean, I, did, I did a couple of things in the immediate aftermath of the Four Seasons, seasons announcement. I put a halt a call for a review to the closure of statutory residential care homes um, because of the volatility that there is within the marketplace. But I've also, to get a better picture of what is going on within our independent sector, I've commissioned a piece of work um, which will look at the market and um, what capacity there is in the market, will look at those various pressures that the, the independent sector are facing and give us a better view an independent view of what is happening within adult social care in terms of nursing homes so that we can we are better informed in terms of the decisions that we are making so that we aren't jumping to what somebody says that we should be doing over here or somebody says that we should be doing over there where we are taking evidence based decisions with a full and complete understanding of what is happening within the, the, the social care market. Well, Mr Tom McCann for a topic of question. Thank you Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what role uh, can nurses play in the transformation of the health service that he wishes to see? One of the, in fact, the very first event that I did um, when I became Minister was attend an event uh, at the Ulcer Hospital around nurses and one of the first formal events that I did thereafter was attend Nurse of the Year Awards and at both I, I pointed out that I, I really view um, nurses as not just the corner, one of the cornerstones of the health and social care system but also um, as pivotal to implementing reform, um, the, the reform that I think we all we know we need across health and social care. And one of the things that I, I can recall very clearly from the Nurse of the Year Awards was that all of the nominees and all of the recipients of awards 
were receiving their awards and the acknowledgements of their peers because of the changes and reforms that they had themselves initiated across the system. Uh, and I know sometimes I think we, we, we don't view nurses as being innovators in that sense, but the, the, the ability and the skill and the capacity that they have to implement change and bring forward new ideas is, is, is truly impressive. And I really do see them as absolutely critical to implementing the reforms that we need across our system. I'm afraid there isn't time for a supplementary because time is up.